Give me your address and I can tell you how long you will live. If you were black or Latino, Chinese and Japanese, you were perceived as less valuable and therefore accorded fewer rights. And over time, what that has created is essentially fewer opportunities, access to fewer resources, and that correlates precisely with life expectancy. Within Oakland, for instance, you've got parts of the flatlands of East Oakland and West Oakland where life expectancy is on the order of 68, 70 years and just a mile and a half away. In the Oakland Hills, you have neighborhoods where life expectancy is 85, 86, 88 years. In Los Angeles, in South Central, parts of Boyle Heights, you've got life expectancies in the low 70s. And then you go to Beverly Hills, Pacific Palisades, and you see life expectancies in the mid to high 80s. All of that is not about people being genetically stronger or fitter or even having better lifestyles. It's really about opportunity. In 2008, I tried to move legislation that would have eliminated racial covenants in any property document in the state of California upon sale. De La Torres introduced a bill that would require county recorders to delete racial covenants from deeds any time a property is sold. And uh, Governor Schwarzenegger vetoed the bill. It's such a tough thing to unravel. Decades of housing patterns up and down the state of California. Land is something that, that we didn't create. Land is something that exists in nature. Real estate, on the other hand, is a construct of economic relationships and rules. This country has always operated under the assumption that one day most people who want to be homeowners will be homeowners. But now we're at a point where it's much harder to make that argument for any group that's not already fairly wealthy or, or, or affluent. So I think more and more people are realizing I may never be an owner. And so if you're looking at life as a long-term renter, all of a sudden the issue of renter's rights and evictions and all those kinds of issues, which probably a lot of people didn't think about, are now thinking about. We are renter cities. And so we really have to think differently about exercising the power that, that tenants can have in this country to transform the relationship between private property and the public good. It was in the early 2000s when Metro began its plans to extend the gold line. Um, in order to build the rail, they displaced um, you know, a lot of families. So that's something that people in the community remember. So 
So when developments were presented, like the one at Mariachi Plaza, community members pushed back. The first meeting that Metro hosted to present the proposals, person after person after person was there to express their anger. Folks were really upset about the process. They felt that they had been left out. Folks felt they weren't involved in deciding what would go on those lines. I have and, and will continue to take responsibility for the bad timing and not really understanding fully the community when we were doing this. In hindsight, of course, I'd say there should have been a lot of conversations with some key community stakeholders to understand what had happened in the past and, and, and where we were at. For Mariachi Plaza, we said, we're going to start over. We went through about a year-long community engagement process. We had focus groups, and we came up with a set of development guidelines for the Mariachi Plaza site. There is a certain process to engaging with folks who have been left out. You need to go beyond the neighborhood council. You need to go beyond um, homeowner associations. Oil Heights had a huge impact. It was ground zero for realizing we're gonna not do things the old way and do it a new way. People who are living in the community that is subject to the development imperative or the change that's about to happen need to be fundamentally engaged in the process of that change. And they need to be engaged early, at the beginning, at the design stage, so that they have an opportunity to shape what happens. Every neighborhood has to have a different solution. It is not one template that fits all. It needs education. It needs housing, employment. It needs health care and it needs wealth accumulation opportunities. Well, this is your unit right up here in the kids. spot to be. This guy that worked at the filler station late night to the next morning, he used to always put a sign on the bathroom door and he would let me sleep in there and tell people it was out of order. Mm -hmm. I got blessed. <laughs> I ended up going to the shelter because I got tired of being all in the sun. And then from there, I got my Section 8 voucher to be able to move into Roland Curtis. Roland Curtis is 48 units of subsidized housing. 90% black folks. Most of the average family had been living in the building for about 10 years. My old apartment, I was here for seven to eight years. A lot of positive memories, a lot of uh, positive changes. <laughs> it was a good neighborhood, you know. The bad part came was when it was time to move. There was the billionaire who had bought the property and then dropped 90-day notices to evict everyone from the building. He had purchased the property clearly with the intention of converting the property to market. Everybody started panicking, you know, especially the ones that had been there so many years. They figured they would be there the rest of their life. I was losing it for real. I didn't know what I was going to do. I did not know what I was going to do, where I was going to go, where I was going to stay. That's when we had stepped in to buy the building.
Trust South LA is a community land trust. We are basically a community land bank. We actually come out of a model from the Civil Rights Movement. A group of black farmers in 69, they were sharecroppers, and were able to get the government to set aside about 20,000 acres of land. They produced their own goods. They were able to create a level of industry for themselves and stability for those families during the Civil Rights Movement. The land trust is structured to remove land from the speculative market. The land itself is controlled by the community, returning land to being a common good. When you do a land trust, you're saying that the land is not going to allow its value to go up and down uh, based on what's happening in the market. When you build affordable housing, you're saying that that housing's value, its rental, is going to be locked in so that low-income people can continue to afford it. We knew going in to the acquisition that we had to redevelop the property at higher density in order to actually pay for it. So we took residents from the building, from the neighborhood, and other community stakeholders to produce site plans. The community vision that was created was three levels. It's going to be 138 units of all affordable housing. It will have commercial space on the ground floor. There will be a full service clinic by St. John's. The vision for the new project was all created by the residents themselves and folks who live around um, Roland Curtis. We believe that this is a model that could be replicated around the country to get in front of these generational issues that continue to impact and destabilize our communities. The biggest question we face is whether or not we're really gonna have the courage to recognize housing as a human right and to take it out of a market and understand the importance of home and not just house as something that you sell and exchange. I don't wanna keep going from apartment to apartment to apartment and then I, I definitely don't wanna be living in a worse neighborhood. A, a nice two bedroom house with a front and backyard, you know, in a good area, that's all I want. Anything else, I can make it happen after that. We really have to challenge the systems that have created this environment to begin with. And, you know, in order to really challenge all of those systems, like we need to challenge the way we've been ingrained to think about our relationship to land and housing and to the money, to the economy. And those are some things that we can start doing today. How do you effectively change policies? How do you get to the root of it we need stability. If we can keep people in place, we can start to increase voter turnout. Grassroots organizing is an important tool and will always be an important tool, but certainly you also need to have folks on the inside who are the decision makers. And it really takes what, what I call like an inside-outside strategy. You have to have both. There is no silver bullet. Cities alone can't fix it. Private developers alone can't fix it. State law alone can't fix it. The one thing that we have on our side is people power. This country is not the land of opportunity. It stratifies opportunity according to perceived value. But it's our hope that by building power, we can hold systems accountable for the equitable distribution of resources in those communities. We're not going to be able to do this unless we fundamentally believe in democracy. And democracy, uh, its best measure is who shows up, who participates, who raises their voice.